DiscerningHearts.com presents A Handmaid of the Lord The Life and Legacy of Adrienne von Speyer with Dr. Adrian Walker Dr. Walker is an editor of the journal Communio, an international Catholic review. He received his doctorate in philosophy at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. He has served as a translator for the English edition of Pope Benedict XVI's Jesus of Nazareth, as well as numerous other theological works, including those of Hans Urs von Balthasar and Adrienne von Speyer. Adrienne von Speyer is a Swiss convert, mystic, wife, medical doctor, and author of over 60 books on spirituality and theology. She's inspired countless souls around the world to deepen their mission of prayer and compassion. She entered the Catholic Church under the direction of the great theologian Hans Urs von Balthasar. In the years that would follow, they would co-found the secular institute, the Community of St. John. A Handmaid of the Lord, The Life and Legacy of Adrienne von Speyer with Dr. Adrienne Walker. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Adrienne, thank you so much for joining me. Chris, thank you for having me. It's uh, quite a pleasure. To be able to discuss the prayer life of Adrienne von Speyer, when you mention her, oftentimes people will say, well, she was a mystic. I could never be a mystic. What is problematic with that mindset? Well, I suppose what's problematic about it in this case is that it blocks access to the person of Adrienne and to her work because you think, well, if she's a mystic and had all of these phenomena and experiences, then she's sort of on a different plane of existence and so has nothing to say to me. Or... The other uh, response, which you often hear, is, ooh, that's mysticism. That's weird. That's weird stuff. Of course, when you think about it, both of those reactions are sort of odd. What about Teresa of Avila? What about St. Bridget of Sweden? What about Hildegard of Bingen, you know, our, our, our newest doctor of the church? I mean, you can't dismiss any of them as strange. And at the same time, nobody would think, ooh, I can't read Teresa of Avila, or I can't read Bridget of Sweden, or I shouldn't read... Hildegard of Bingen, because it's it's sort of too complex for me. We all know lots of people who have been nourished by the writings of somebody like Teresa of Avila. I mean, simple people, normal people, ordinary people. And it seems to me that the same thing would apply here. Of course, yes, Adrienne did have some remarkable experiences, remarkable gifts, and so on and so forth. But she's no weirder and no more inaccessible than Teresa of Avila or Bridget of Sweden or Hildegard or Catherine of Genoa or Catherine of Siena. I mean, any of these these mystics or people who, who are considered to be mystics. So, yeah, so perhaps there's a sort of a prejudice here that needs to be overcome. And, and it's a good idea to overcome it because once you do and once you actually do begin to sort of frequent the works that she's left us, you realize that, again... There's nothing strange about it. And at the same time, that in one sense, it's very practical in that everything she says, even when she's talking about the Trinity or something like that, is helpful for living one's life in the day-to-day before God. That's an experience that readers of Adrienne have, have had and continue to have. Adrienne herself actually thought a bit about the nature of mysticism Mm -hmm. and what she says in essence about mysticism is that the core of it the most important thing about it is not the experiences and the phenomena it's not even the lofty states of prayer that sort of normal people don't generally have it's obedience it's obedience to God's self-revelation is attested to in Scripture, which is present also in the teachings of the Church and so forth. So it's really this sense that at the core of mysticism, as she understands it, is a simple openness and obedience to, let's say, the Word of God, God revealing himself in his Word, who first of all is the person of Jesus Christ, but then 
that self-revelation is also present in scripture, teaching of the church and so forth. And that helps us understand the connection with St. Ignatius because St. Ignatius, who himself, as a matter of fact, was a great mystic, mm -hmm, um, which, which a lot of people don't realize. I, I remember that the discovery of the mystical Ignatius was a big sort of revelation for me. But again, at the core of Ignatius's prayer is just that, is an opening to and an obedience to God's self-revelation in, in Christ. You can see that in the structure of the exercises. The first week of the exercises, which are divided into four weeks for those who perhaps don't know, the, the, the first week is devoted to a kind of conversion, which has to do with setting aside what Ignatius calls disordered inclinations, you know, all of the, the sort of bad attachments to mm -hmm. this, that, and the other thing, um, to one's own will, fundamentally. And the first week can be a bit of a harrowing experience, but because it involves the contemplation of hell, the hell that one has deserved because of one's sins and so forth. So, I mean, it's, it's pretty serious stuff. But it's it's not an end in itself. It's meant to lead to just what I was saying a minute ago, a kind of an openness to what God is going to show. And always when God shows us something in the first instance, it's about himself and about his plans for the world. And then it's about how we fit into that. That's sort of what's happening in the in the rest of the exercises, as it were, is just encountering God, revealing himself in the person of his only begotten son made man, revealing himself in order to show us who he is, in order to show us what his plans for the world are, in order to show us then how we fit into that. And that Ignatian approach to the relationship with God is something that is very present in Adrienne as well. For her, prayer it does have to do with letting God show you who he is, you know, letting the Father reveal himself to you as Father. So you're always praying together with the Son and the Holy Spirit. The core of it is, is sort of this, yeah, letting the Father reveal himself to us as the Father that he is, so that the focus is primarily on, on God. God giving us to himself as he is in himself and then wanting a response from us in turn. But then all of that is always inside of, at the same time, you know, God's plan for the salvation of the whole world. So there's an intimacy with God, but at the same time, there's also a sense of mission, a sense of participating in some small way in the work of redemption. Yeah, I've heard it defined, obedience, as deep listening, deep, deep listening. So if at the heart of the prayer is the obedience to the Father's will, to the Father who created you. An excerpt from Chapter 1 of The World of Prayer by Adrian von Speyer. In prayer, God enables man to approach him once more. Most people live so estranged from God that prayer's first task must be to make them aware of their distance from God. In the light of prayer, they should recognize what their life thus far has amounted to, what they owe to God, the Father, Son, and Spirit, for which they have not thanked him. In contrition that opens the heart, they ought to try to bridge the abyss which separates them from God. They are to begin their prayer by bringing to a halt the movement that estranges them from God, and so turning back toward Him. Prayer is, first of all, conversion. But perhaps they no longer know what prayer is, and they start praying as if it were the most natural thing in the world, as if it went without saying that God is ready to listen to them, to answer them, and to carry out their wishes. Or they have a slight apprehension of their estrangement, but try not to let it 
enter their consciousness too forcefully or become real in their prayer. They present themselves to God as they are and leave it to God to forget the estrangement, as they have done. But prayer cannot be built on untruth. Every believer who tries to live by his faith will try at least once a day to consider his sin and estrangement so that he can ask God's pardon for it. He need not make this awareness the content of his prayer. Indeed, he must not. Otherwise, he will have too little time for the real approach to God, adoration and thanksgiving. But he may only dare to approach God in the recognition of his distance from him, in sorrow for his sin, and in the humility of the prodigal son, who accepts every grace the Father bestows on him as the most undeserved gift. Not until the pain of his estrangement burns in his soul can the divine fire of grace really burn within him. In turning to God and returning home from our estrangement, we discover that we are entering the existent world of prayer, which is the world of God. We no longer imagine that prayer is something we fashion arbitrarily, to be started and broken off as we wish, one human activity among others that have no necessary connection to it. Now, we understand that we had dropped out of something which in itself is connected and continuous, that prayer, as God offers it to the believer, ought really to have begun at his birth, to end at his death. Man must feel how much he has missed of this life and how incapable he is of making up for it himself for he cannot begin his life all over again at the day of his birth. But at conversion, with the realization of this hopeless incapacity, God grants the genuine possibility of a rebirth, and we may stand before God as newborn men and women each day of our lives, endeavoring to stay faithful to him to the end. Okay, here we go back to I can never be a mystic. And yet, the Father created you and wants to reveal himself to you, not yeah. just to a few, but to all. That's right. Could you say that we are all, in some fashion, called to that deep listening, to that mysticism? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that, that would be another, in fact, that would have perhaps been an even better way to answer your question from the from the beginning, you know, that some theologians have sort of recovered the idea that the mystical life is a is a deepening of the baptismal life, a deepening that in a certain sense is for everybody and not just for a few. That doesn't mean that everybody is going to have the phenomena or the experiences that we typically associate with the word mysticism. But if you understand mysticism, again, to be a kind of obedience, or let's say a kind of filial receptivity that lets the Father do what the Father wants to do, which is to, re I mean, first of all, to reveal himself as the Father and to reveal also his loving plan for the world, then everybody is called to that. In fact, everybody has to be called to that because in a certain sense, that's what the Christian life is, right? I mean, you're baptized into the death and resurrection of Christ so that you can become a son in the Son. Why? So that you can participate in both things. On the one hand, so that you can participate in the Son's relation to the Father in the communion of the Holy Spirit and so that you can participate in the way that the Son took in order to communicate all of that to us, which was by coming into the world, being sent by the Father into the world in order to, to save us, basically, in order to save the world. Mm -hmm. And the Christian life, I mean, already by virtue of baptism, you know, death 
dying with Christ, rising with him. The Christian life is substantially participation in those two things, which in a way are kind of two sides of the same coin. And maybe our problem is that we, we just don't realize that enough. We think maybe being Christian is simply a matter of participating in certain rituals and obeying certain commandments and so forth, rather than seeing that the rituals and the commandments are necessary and central because they have to do with and, and because they express what the substance of the Christian life is, which is participation in the Son's sonship vis-a-vis the Father on the one hand and his, his being sent into the world to communicate and share that sonship on the other. There's something surprising about all of this and maybe we don't let ourselves be surprised enough that, that in, in the sense that not only that God, the Father, who needs absolutely nothing, would want us, but also that our response to that invitation actually matters and that our participation in the work of redemption actually matters. I mean, who are we? We're, in a certain sense, we're nobody, right? We're created out of nothing. Mm-hmm. God didn't need us. If we hadn't existed he would have continued to be just as perfect as he is anyway. Mm -hmm. And yet he wanted this. Again, the the surprise that he should be like that, but also the surprise that that he should consider us to be important enough to to offer us all of this. I mean, that's kind of amazing. And I think that that sense of surprise is something that was kind of important for Adrienne. What you're describing, it's relationship. And a relationship in the heart of the Trinity. And I think if I'm honest with myself about how I felt maybe in the past, and I have to always check myself even today, that I don't think of God as a God way out there as an entity, as opposed to the three persons and that we're called to relationship with persons. Be attentive. You have to listen. You're right. The relationship aspect, as you put it, begins already in God himself. And Adrienne has some beautiful meditations on this relational dimension in God. So, for example, the the beginning of uh, the world of prayer. But it's also a, a teaching that you can find all over the place in our tradition. I mean, it's not something that Adrienne sort of invented. It's something that she understood very profoundly and and I think taught us to see, as it were, in new ways. But the the topic itself is an ancient one. For example, prayer, as it were, begins in the Trinity. Prayer doesn't begin when I decide to talk to God. And it doesn't even really begin when God decides to talk to us. The, The conversational aspect of prayer has always already begun. That's part of what it means for God to be God, is that there's an exchange between the Father and the Son in the Holy Spirit, just as Augustine knew. And we enter into that. And as you say, the listening takes on a new dimension because it's like if you're going to be participate in a conversation, I'm just repeating what you said, Mm -hmm. if you're going to participate in an ongoing conversation which is the most important conversation in the world. And in a certain sense, every other conversation in the world d- derives of it, its importance from that central conversation. And you have to listen and you have to look at how the persons relate to each other, how they speak, what they say, uh, their attitude towards one another and so forth. And you have to let that shape you. Exactly. That's exactly what prayer is for Adrienne. That, that's the core of it. Catholic prayer will almost always, at some time, lead us to confession. By listening so deeply in that conversation that's already occurring in that dwelling inside of us, the conversation of the Spirit, which reveals, not accuses, but convicts. And Christ, who also brings forward the sin, takes on that, asking for mercy, and the Father who brings the mercy. 
we sometimes stop, don't we, Adrian, with we listen, but we don't like what we hear anymore, so we shut it off. Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, in fact, isn't that, you know, when the nuns teach children how to pray, I mean, don't they include repentance among the different acts that you're supposed to perform? I mean, so it's in the catechism mm-hmm. already. I think what you're saying is absolutely decisive. Mm-hmm. Right. Because... I mean, that experience will take you to the very point where, to the very thing that God used as a door to bring us into his Trinitarian life, which is what prayer is, right? Mm-hmm. It, it becomes mystery. I mean, it's a mysterium, it's, it's sacrament, it's ultimate end. It's a participation in the divine life. What's the divine life? Yeah. The divine life is, tell me if it's too simplistic. But it's God. And yeah. what is God? God is love. Yeah. So to the ultimate end, the purpose for our prayer ultimately is to for us to be brought in fully into love. Yeah, no, exactly. That's right. That's right. And the mystery here is that Christ on the cross like the, in the it says in the epistle to Peter, you know, the first epistle, he himself bore our sins in his body up onto the tree. So he took our sin upon himself. But by doing that, he changed it. Because sin is an absolute no to God. Sin is a refusal of love. It's a re- and and it's a refusal of the love that God is in Himself which is eternal life. And so it's a refusal of eternal life. It's hell. It leads, mortal sin leads to hell. I mean, it, it, it's two sides of the same coin. But he changed it by taking it upon himself because in in a very precise sense, he didn't make sin good because you can't. But what he did is he used sin in order to, to do just the opposite, in order to save us from our no and to change our no into a yes. That's what he did. He used the overcoming of sin in order to open us from a no into a yes. So in other words, he used the the very worst thing in order to give us an access to the very best thing. This is the mystery is that the mystery of the redemption, which we experience in the confessional, is the mystery of God liberating us from our no to love, using our very no to love, our sin, and using the destruction of our sin on the cross in order to open us to the love that God is in himself. And that opening, a central way for us to live that opening is prayer. That's what prayer would be, is a kind of deepening realization of being opened into this conversation of love that's going on inside of God. An excerpt from Chapter 1 of The World of Prayer by Adrian von Speyer. We could define prayer as standing constantly before God, our unobstructed fellowship with Him, our will to hear and follow him despite all the hindrances within us. It is a deep, fundamental readiness, therefore that provides the foundation for all particular dialogues and acts of prayer. This readiness must accompany us through all our daily work, condensing at certain times into what we are accustomed to call prayer in the restricted sense that state in which there is no room left in us for anything but God's voice, our listening to it, and our acknowledgement. Once he has learned to live with the Word of God, keeping the Lord's words within him and never becoming estranged from them, having them so near that he can recall them at any time, he will discover how to live in a continual attitude of prayer without ever slipping from it. 
By the Lord's grace, he will learn how to be forever in the presence of the Word, as the Son was in the Father's presence, in a continual intercourse with him, which for the most part does not need words to express it, and in a constant attentiveness to what the Father does and desires. Prayer will result in an attitude of obedience. And as prayer gradually becomes an activity controlling the whole life, all the events of daily life will be seen, perhaps unconsciously at first, in connection with God. All things become signposts mysteriously leading to God, revealing proofs of His existence and presenting ways of drawing closer to Him. This experience will further encourage the one praying to strive for an uninterrupted attitude of prayer. His own self will be less and less a single, isolated, unconnected entity in relation to people and things. It will become inseparable from the connections revealed in prayer. His manner of seeing the world and of judging things will spring from his attitude of prayer. Conversely, things will no longer seem alien, unintelligible to him. They are God's world, to which God continually provides the key in prayer. You've been listening to A Handmaid of the Lord, The Life and Legacy of Adrian von Speyer with Dr. Adrian Walker. To learn more about the books available by Adrian von Speyer, go to Ignatius.com, the website for Ignatius Press. To learn more about the work and mission of Casa Balthazar, go to casabalthazar.org. To hear and or to download this discussion, along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of discerninghearts.com. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join me next time for A Handmaid of the Lord, The Life and Legacy of Adrian von Speyer with Dr. Adrian Walker.